sometimes the air we breathe isn't as clean as we think it is. Um, so the way we live our life in society, particularly uh, how we use transport, essentially means that loads of bad toxic gases and little particles are emitted into the air. Breathing clean air is a human right. Right now, the authorities are violating our human right for clean air. Well, air pollution is a public health emergency because we're now hitting a critical mass of different types of knowledge about the harm and the extent of harm uh, that air pollution is doing to our population. Normally when we speak of air pollution, we are talking about two different components within it. Firstly, nitrous oxides, which are gases um, that are released when things like petrol are burned. And then secondly, particulate matter, which are tiny particles imperceptible to the eye. Once you breathe that in, um, that goes straight into your bloodstream and into your lungs. People just think that the lungs are organs that don't communicate with the rest of the body. It's not true. That's mm -hmm. how these small particles can actually enter the bloodstream and they can go up to the brain or go to the heart. Air pollution, particularly the small particles, can actually cross the blood-brain barrier. So you breathe them in, they can cross the blood-brain barrier and actually cause inflammation in the brain. Living in more polluted areas areas is linked to slower um, mental growth, slower cognitive growth and um, that's when you keep everything else, socio-economic background, age, all those things the same. Kids who uh, were exposed to the highest levels of air pollution in the study were about three to four times more likely to have a diagnosis of depression or of conduct disorder um, than those who lived in the lowest levels of air pollution. People who live in, in closer to polluted areas, closer to main roads with higher levels of gases um, which are pollutants have higher levels of uh, dementia when you keep everything else the same. And we see for things like physical abuse and other forms of victimisation, um, those have a kind of, if you like, a, a twofold impact on the development of mental health problems. Um, whereas in, in this study we see that air pollution actually has almost a fourfold impact on the developmental health problems. We've seen specific cases where deaths have been linked specifically to spikes in pollution. In the UK, air pollution causes up to 36,000 premature deaths a year. In 2012, one in eight deaths were linked to air pollution around the world, and that is more than alcohol and obesity. 600,000 of those were children under five. The reason I got involved in this in the first place was when I was pregnant with my first child I did a carbon monoxide test and I had really high levels of carbon monoxide in my lungs and they said it's probably because of air pollution. It has been seen that if you're having treatment or you're not having treatment and you're pregnant and you're exposed to pollutants, your chance of having a miscarriage goes up by 5%. The air that I was breathing, which I couldn't do anything yeah, about, I had no control over it, was already affecting my child in in the womb. Air pollution has um, a negative growth on the on the foetus and can lead to abnormal development. That damage is probably already done and probably he's already breathing bad air and it's probably accumulating in his body. When they grow up they might be more at risk of developing a lung condition such as asthma, COPD or lung cancer. So actually it might impair the the normal growth of their organs. Living in an area of high pollution, um, research says that by the time you're eight to nine years old, it's a five to 10% reduced lung capacity. So the idea of just being able to kind of accept that my son will have five to 10% reduced lung capacity purely because of the air he breathes. My role is to try and reduce that as much as possible to reduce air pollution exposure. I think it's a, the mark of a civilised society that we look after our children and we would have a major problem if we could see our children drinking dirty water. Um, it's th exactly the same, why should we let children uh, be breathing dirty air when they go to nurseries or go to schools? The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is the most ratified treaty internationally. It basically is a list of things that children around the world, regardless of where they live, regardless of who they are, they're entitled to. But the one that's most important for air pollution is the right to a safe and clean environment. And the UK government is really failing in its duty to the children of the UK to provide them with that safe and clean environment by not tackling air pollution.
one of the targets for nitrogen dioxide is in an hour, no more than 200 micrograms per cubic meter, 200. At that level, it is a toxic gas um, that the World Health Organization says no human exposure. However, when we get told that air pollution is moderate, when we look at what moderate means for the government, that's from 201 to 400. So it's really important to know that legal doesn't necessarily equate with clean or healthy. The clean air targets that the government's brought out are a response to the fact that we have been in breach of EU rules for clean air for the last few years. You know, it's very much the case that whenever the government is, is slow to do things, it's got to, you know, it's got to move mountains in terms of policy to get things done. Um, you know, and people want a solution, then you know, that's where entrepreneurs, businesses come in and they say, look, we can offer that. There's almost this kind of gap in the market where people need to protect themselves and have to cope because there just isn't kind of the political ambition or the political will that are for change demonstrated. Because currently there's no viable solution on the market that's really proven to be productive for individuals who want to, who choose to wear an illusion mask to protect themselves. And what we're trying to do is develop a product that's truly effective. Babies cannot wear a facial mask. And that's where we came in with Breezy. So in terms of our filtration technology and airflow and engineering, we see the future very much for every single workplace and building should have our technology for clean the produced air coming in. This is a cushion shape device that is a sensor activated. The sensor detects the pollution and starts the fan. The fan sucks the air through a layer of filtration and pushes clean air from the other side, creating a barrier of clean air in front of the baby breathing area. The name is MCSC, it's a modular city air cleaner. It's a giant air purifier that we would like to install in every square, in every capital of the world. And what we do is essentially sell jars of air um, to people across the world living in polluted cities or polluted areas um, that don't have access to clean air. And I always say I'd like air labs not to exist. I'd like everyone to be breathing clean air, but while we don't breathe clean air, we do need to protect ourselves. If you don't have the ability to pay for clean air, um, then yeah, you're not going to have access to it. I think unfortunately it's hard even wearing a filter uh, to, to know that you're safe from the harmful effects of air pollution. And aside from anything, I think it's basically disgraceful that people should have to wear a gas mask when they're in a public area. Car manufacturers are unfortunately not the people who are going to be leading uh, or, or even helping us to address these problems and it's only under the severest pressure that they not only acknowledge um, the problems of air pollution uh, but they start to do something about them. Should the car lobby want to survive 50 years into the future, do they now need to be actually pushing for electric vehicles and moving themselves into the electric vehicle space? So the electric car market's been growing quite fast in the UK. From, from a very low base, there's still only sort of 1% or 2% market share of overall cars. But um, in the context of overall car sales uh, falling in the UK last year, we saw 19% growth in electric car sales. So the sort of balance of power is shifting towards electric cars. We're uh, trying to develop the infrastructure so that people can switch from uh, petrol and diesel fueled cars over to uh, electric cars. We currently have one of the largest electric bus fleets in London and we're looking to try and electrify the bus fleet as much as possible. In the last 20 years um, it's got about 20% cheaper to drive and it's got about 20 to 30% more expensive to, uh, to use public transport. To put all kind of faith in some kind of technological solution um, seems like a bit of a risk when like we're already seeing the effects of climate change killing people across the world. The government have currently said that they're going to phase out petrol and diesel cars by 2040. Many European countries have committed to do so by 2025 or 2030. From a pollution perspective and from a climate perspective, both of those things are weak and they're quite inadequate. Unless we want catastrophic climate change, we have 12 years to cut our emissions um, globally by 45%. From an air pollution aspect, that is however many years, 22 years of worsening air quality. Currently, the transport sector is one of the biggest sectors for, for the UK CO2 emission at 26%. So we know if we want to get on track for our climate change targets, we've got to fix um, pollution and the pollution sources too. I think it's really symbolic of government and corporate um, attitudes towards climate change. It's, we'll pick a date far into the future that we maybe this 
administration or these bunch of executives don't have to deal with. We can't wait for, tw for 2040. The problem is now, the effects are now. So we already see some of what we, we will uh, probably start to see in this country uh, in places like China where you have uh, buildings that need to be essentially airtight uh, because the air quality outside is, is very unsafe. We will see situations where people, more and more people are forced to wear masks when they're outside and we essentially make our outside spaces uninhabitable. You have no control over what you, what you breathe and it is very, I think it's very good that we are recommending people to walk down different routes but we shouldn't have to, you know, change or commute or to do these things. We should be able to walk everywhere in London or in Birmingham or in Manchester and not have to worry about the air we breathe.